In this program, we've discussed that when you're managing a project, you always have to consider the triple constraint, time, scope, and budget. Each of these three elements will impact the project, and if any one of them suffers, the overall quality of the project suffers too. There's an important distinction between quality and done. Simply finishing a project isn't enough. The project must meet the customer's standards of quality rather than just be completed. Like all things in project management, the more effectively you communicate with your team, the more likely your team will produce high quality deliverables. So how do we define quality in a project management sense? Quality is when you fulfill the outlined requirements for the deliverable and meet or exceed the needs or expectations of your customers. When it comes to quality, it's important to deliver a product or service that meets your customers' needs. To meet their needs, you have to know important quality management concepts and oversee the implementation of a project management quality plan. To set yourself up for success, you should consider the four main concepts of quality management, which are quality standards, quality planning, quality assurance, and quality control. The quality process begins with setting quality standards. Quality standards provide requirements, specifications, or guidelines that can be used to ensure that products, processes, or services are fit for achieving the desired outcome. Set quality standards with your team and your customer at the beginning of your project. Take the time to define the quality standards and criteria for your current work so that your team members and stakeholders understand exactly what they are. After you set those well-defined quality standards, you'll want to check in periodically and make sure everything looks okay and the requirements are met. Remember that well-defined standards and requirements lead to less rework and schedule delays. Let's put this in an example using the scenario we've been using throughout the program. You're a project manager at Office Green, a company that specializes in plant decor for offices and other businesses, and you're leading a project called Plant Pals a new service that will provide top clients with desk-friendly plants. Here's an example of a few quality standards for this project. Reliability standards. Each planter arrives by the agreed upon time and in good condition, ready to be placed at a desk. And the suppliers have enough plants in their warehouses to fulfill the customer demand on time. Usability standards. Planters won't cause customers allergic reactions or illness, and will be suitable for all people and animals if necessary. Similarly, you may have product standards. The supplier should meet your brand's look and feel, use the specified materials, and be delivered intact. You should adhere to quality standards across all products and processes. For instance, you may have usability standards implemented in the website development process by stating that the website must be easy to navigate, whether from a phone, computer, or tablet. Next up, quality planning. Quality planning refers specifically to the actions of a project manager or the team to establish and conduct a process for identifying and determining exactly which standards of quality are in fact relevant to the project as a whole and how to satisfy them. To steer that discussion, you can ask yourself, what outcome do my customers want at the end of this project? What does quality look like for them? How can I meet their expectations? And how will I determine if the quality measures will lead to project success? This is where you'll plan the procedures to achieve the quality standards. Recall that one of the Project Plant Pal's quality standards is reliability. The expectation that each plant arrives on time and in good condition. So as a quality planning measure, you'll need to make plans with your plant provider to test the durability of your planters before you decide to use them. The third concept of quality management is quality assurance. Quality assurance, often shortened to QA, is all about evaluating if your project is moving towards delivering a high quality service or product. Unlike quality standards and quality planning, QA spans the whole project lifecycle rather than taking place at a specific phase. Your quality plan should include regular audits to confirm that everything is going to plan and the necessary procedures are being followed. Regular check-ins and reporting to stakeholders will help boost their confidence and yours along the way. Quality assurance is where you'll make sure that you and your clients are getting the exact product you contracted for. 
So at Project Plant Pals, this is where your team will inspect options for planters and perhaps sit in on the durability testing. If you make plans for your plant provider to handle the durability testing on their own, make sure you are tracking their progress and checking in regularly. The final concept of quality management is quality control, often shortened to QC. Here, techniques are used in order to ensure quality standards when a problem is identified, or if the quality plan is not executed in the desired manner and corrective actions should be effected. Quality control involves monitoring project results and delivery to determine if they're meeting desired results or not. If not, then alternative actions should be taken. Quality control is also integral to creating a more successful landing for the next project. After the plants are placed throughout the customer's offices, quality control may look like you or your team member taking a final walkthrough of the offices where the plants were delivered. You'd be checking for things like broken planters or plants that were damaged in transit and swapping them out when necessary. You may not do this for every customer, but it's a good idea to do it as you're starting out in case you spot issues to improve upon when you're back in the office. If you've stuck to your quality plan, checking on quality throughout the life cycle of your project, QA, and of course, correcting as needed, QC, the likelihood of meeting your quality standards is high, resulting in a high quality deliverable at the end of your project that satisfies your organizational goals and exceeds the customer's expectations. And there you have it, quality management. Great, so now we've learned more about how to identify and explain the concept of quality management, which include quality standards, quality planning, quality assurance, and quality control. By now, you probably understand that communication is paramount to a project's successful landing. It's the lifeblood of the whole project. Communication starts before the project even begins and carries on steadily throughout the remainder of the project. In this video, I'm going to explain how using soft skills like negotiation, delivering messages with empathy, and asking questions for clarity helps to foster and strengthen communication. We'll also discuss feedback as a foundation for iterating on a product. According to the Project Management Institute, it's been found that most projects experience a communication breakdown of some kind, even though project managers spend about 90% of their time working on communication alone. It's in a project manager's best interest to communicate tactfully, not only with the members of their own organization, but also with customers and vendors. When done well, Strategic communication with a customer or client can instill a sense of confidence that you're doing a good job and that you're a trustworthy partner. So how should a project manager approach communication with a customer? Using soft skills like negotiation, empathetic listening, and trust building will help foster a good relationship between you and your customers, and a good project manager knows how and when to apply these skills. A key practice for negotiation, empathetic listening, and trust building is asking questions. It's important to ask open-ended questions and actively listen to understand the customer's current state versus their desired state, and what might help them get from here to there. If you ask open-ended questions, you'll find out where you can make your customers feel more secure. You'll be able to negotiate to ensure both of your needs are met and you'll build the necessary trust to have a successful partnership. High-performing project managers set clear expectations about when they'll communicate certain things to their customers. For example, you might want to set an expectation that you'll provide weekly progress updates to keep clients informed, rather than expecting them to come to you with questions. When troubleshooting an issue with the product, it might not be necessary to fill the customer in on an issue that won't affect the outcome. Let's say a designer on your team quit and you had to replace them. You may be able to replace that designer with a new one fairly quickly and not even skip a beat in your project's progress. You can complete the task at hand without giving the customer any additional worry. The level of visibility between customers and clients on a given project may vary, and you'll have to use your judgment regarding what's important to communicate to your client. Sometimes you'll want to tell your client if there's an issue. If you reach a point in the project where you can't possibly move forward without their help and input, you'll have to communicate the issue to them calmly and with empathy. Let's put this into Project Plant Plow's context, where we're troubleshooting an issue with broken planters. 
Maybe. When we were putting together our quality standards, we left some room for supplier error and accounted for some broken planters. We'll say we figured an acceptable number of broken planters was two out of every 50. But let's imagine that the customer received a shipment and there were five broken planters. At that point, we'll need to meet with the customer and ask important negotiation questions. We'll need to decide if the five broken planters out of every 50 is an acceptable outcome, or we'll need to discuss whether the customer would consider investing in a higher tier of planters that may be less prone to breaking. Presenting a solution, like using sturdier planters, will affect their budget, and they'll need to adjust accordingly. Is the customer okay with that change? Would that lead to another trade-off? Keeping in mind that the main goal here is customer satisfaction throughout the negotiation process, you'll want to be considerate of their feelings and limitations. You can do this by exhibiting empathy, understanding their frustrations, addressing them, and finding a solution that's beneficial for both of you. You may have held a customer-facing role in the past, whether that's in a call center, as a retail associate, as a server in a restaurant, or any number of positions. Even if you haven't, you've probably been an advocate for yourself while conversing with a customer service representative. Because of this, you'll probably have a good idea of what good customer service looks like. Good customer service results in choosing to go back to the same hair salon, bakery, or coffee shop because you like the way that you're treated and the service you received, even if you had an issue, versus choosing not to go back to those places if you don't receive that level of care. Your past experiences have taught you to manage relationships and to avoid delivering something that's low quality. It doesn't feel great when you're on the receiving end. In order to yield better results in future projects, it's necessary to get feedback from customers. Sometimes this feedback will come during the process and sometimes it'll come after the project is completed, depending on how you map it out in the initiation phase. The matter of when you receive feedback may come down to what you actually want to accomplish in your project. If your business is launching an e-commerce site, you will want user feedback so you can make adjustments to optimize the customer's shopping experience. If your business is an on-demand cookie delivery service, you may want to deliver the cookies and then get their user feedback to know how your customers felt about the cookies and the delivery experience as a whole. User feedback helps to close any gaps in understanding between the customer's expectation and the project's needs. So to summarize very briefly, soft skills like negotiation, empathetic listening, and trust building will help create a good relationship between you and your customers. And getting feedback from those customers will help you to iterate on a product or service. As promised, we're going to discuss user testing and feedback. If the end goal of our project is to have a great quality product or service for both our own organization and our customer, we need to get an idea of what the customer wants. We already learned how to make sure something is high quality on our end. Now let's find out how to measure what clients want so we can meet their needs, expectations, and standards. The best way to get an idea of what customers and users want is to ask them but we don't mean calling each of them up on the phone and literally asking them. That might not be the best use of our time. Fortunately, there are a few ways we can streamline that information. We can conduct a series of surveys or tests with customers and users. Some common ones are feedback surveys and user acceptance tests. Let's start with feedback surveys. Feedback surveys are a survey in which users provide feedback on features of your product that they like or dislike. These surveys can take place as you design, before you launch, in order to find out if people like and understand the product, or after you've launched, if you want to make sure the user experience is even more satisfying. So your users participate in a survey and give you feedback on what features they like or dislike, and potentially which aspects they find to be fairly intuitive and which aspects are a little tougher to navigate. After you get that feedback, you'll either be good to launch, if you haven't yet, or you'll go back and iterate on the product if it's already on the market. Alternatively, you might conduct user acceptance tests. In broader terms, a user acceptance test, or a UAT, is a test that helps a business make sure that a product or solution works for its users. 
a UAT must meet the agreed upon requirements and deliver the expected results. This test is typically used to assess the end-to-end -end experience for the user of a new process or product. A user acceptance test is incredibly important because it takes place near the end of a product's development and therefore is an overall user experience test of the entire product, software, or service. UATs are sometimes referred to as beta tests. Let's find out what a user acceptance test agenda might look like. In a typical UAT setting, you'll welcome your users and thank them for participating. Then you'll present the product to them. This includes discussing testing guidelines and demonstrating how the product works. Next, you'll start your UAT test cases, taking your audience through critical user journeys. A critical user journey is the sequence of steps a user follows to accomplish tasks in your product. When presenting something you've built, you must give users a visual representation or mock-up of your product or have them go through a demo. For example, if you're working on a construction-based project and you intend to replace all appliances and hardware in the home, you'll want to give the user some sort of vision of what that might entail. This could include 3D models, digital blueprints, samples, and more. Your UAT demo should focus on a call to action. For instance, the call to action for your project may be the need to test hardware in the client's future home. Maybe the homeowners have requested a dishwasher that can be opened and closed with very little force and doesn't make too much noise. In that case, you'll want to give the client real life scenarios to work with in. Ask them to load the dishes and start the wash cycle. Then ask questions like, on a scale of one to 10, how much force was required to open and close the dishwasher to determine if the washer meets their expectations? During your presentation and walkthrough of the UAT, you should be collecting feedback from the users on their overall experience. During this part of testing, your users will be able to help you identify edge cases. Edge cases are rare outliers that the original requirements didn't account for. They deal with the extreme maximums and minimums of parameters. For example, imagine that you created an app that allows for unlimited photo uploads, knowing that users will rarely upload more than a thousand photos in a single session. How will the system deal with someone who actually does upload thousands of photos or millions in a single upload? It's unlikely, but it could be disastrous for your software. After identifying edge cases, the last step of the UAT agenda is to recap your findings, identify bugs or issues, and prioritize which issues need to be addressed first. When you've addressed the issue and determined next steps, you'll be able to close and conclude your user acceptance testing. And there you have it. So we've learned a bit more about the importance of listening to feedback from customers and discuss some common methods for measuring customer satisfaction like feedback surveys, user acceptance tests, and edge cases. That's a lot to learn. Keep it up. You're doing great so far. Hello again, I'm Holly. If you've been following this program from start to finish, you may remember me from an earlier course where I shared a bit about accessibility and why it's so important to keep it in mind as a project manager. So far, you've learned the importance of managing, communicating, and measuring quality. This is a great opportunity to also think about how to ensure the ways you are collecting feedback and the processes in place to measure quality are fair and accessible. First, if you are collecting feedback through live interviews, be sure to include an offer to provide accommodations in your correspondence when setting up the sessions. You may get requests for live captioning or an interpreter, other folks, such as those with anxiety or on the autism spectrum, may ask to see the questions in advance so that they have time to think about and prepare their answers. Remember, what works for one person may not work for another person, even if those two people have the same disability. If you're conducting an interview on location, examine the space with an accessibility lens, like ensuring there's an accessible path into the building and to the room, and that hallways are clear of clutter that could block someone using a wheelchair or walker or someone with a visual impairment from easily and safely moving through. If sending a survey or collecting feedback using technology, check that the systems you are using are fully accessible. If you're unsure, contact the system owner and ask if they are compliant with the latest web content accessibility guidelines or WCAG. 
be prepared to provide questions and collect responses in an alternate manner if needed. Beyond collecting feedback, as a project manager, it's important for you to make accessibility part of the conversation from the beginning, especially if your project pertains to a process or product. Oftentimes, incorporating accessible features into a product is overlooked or left to the final stages of a project and can lead to serious implications like launch delays or worse, a product that can't be used by a percentage of the population. Ensure your developers are familiar with accessibility requirements at the start. If they're not, help connect them with appropriate resources or experts. Include testers with various disabilities in your usability testing whenever possible. And at the very least, have the product tested for adherence to accessibility guidelines. In summary, think about accessibility early and often, and encourage others on your project team to do so too. Coming up, you'll practice ways to measure quality and learn more about managing changes, risk, and so much more. Keep up the great work. In this video, we'll explore how to advocate for and create continuous improvements in a project by learning about process improvements. Continuous improvement is an ongoing effort to improve products or services. It helps ensure that a project steadily makes its way toward the best possible outcome. Continuous improvement begins with recognizing when processes and tasks need to be created, eliminated, or improved. Then a project manager must plan for and implement changes to keep the project on track. That's where process improvement comes from. Process improvement is the practice of identifying, analyzing, and improving existing processes to enhance the performance of your team and to develop best practices, or to optimize consumer experiences. When working through process improvements, using a controlled environment in an experiment can help you understand if the changes you're considering fix your problem. A control is an experiment or observation designed to minimize the effects of variables. Control groups are representative samples that help you to determine that the differences between your experimental groups and the norm are due to your changes rather than something else. They eliminate alternative explanations for your results. If you aren't familiar with this, that's okay, because I'll break it down for you. For example, you observe a problem with your process and put forward a hypothesis, which is an educated guess about what's causing the problem and how you'd fix it. Then you change one variable in the system, keeping the control group the same, and observe your results again. Let's put this in the context of Project Plant Pals scenario. Business is booming for Office Green, and demand for your team's new Plant Pal service is rapidly growing. To meet the demand, suppliers have streamlined their process of packing boxes and putting all plants into a one-size-fits-all box. Let's say you're using just one box size to ship all of your plants. For smaller plants, there's more padding added to the box to fill the extra space, and the plants usually arrive intact. But larger plants have to be squeezed into the boxes and sometimes arise damaged, according to customer surveys. To fix this problem, you hypothesize a potential solution by posing a question. Would more of the large plants arrived intact if they were shipped in bigger boxes, using the same padding we use for the small plants? Here's where your control comes in. You continue to ship half of the larger plants in the original boxes. This is your control group. And you experiment by shipping the other half in bigger boxes. Nothing else is different about the boxes except the size, the shape, thickness, box supplier, delivery addresses, absolutely everything else stays exactly the same. After the larger plants are delivered, you conduct a new survey. If more larger plants arrived intact, your hypothesis is confirmed. If the results are the same as they were before the experiment, you'll need to try something else to solve the problem of your damaged plants. Working in a controlled environment isn't the only way to ensure continuous improvements. There are various data-driven improvement frameworks like DeMacy and PDCA. I'll define those and present them in the context of Plant Pals in the next video. See you there. In the last video, I introduced the concept of continuous improvements. We explored in depth how working in a controlled environment can optimize your outcomes. In this video, we're going to keep on that same path of uncovering methods for continuous improvements. 
We'll start with data-driven improvement frameworks. Data-driven improvement frameworks are techniques used to make decisions based on actual data. The first data-driven improvement framework we'll cover may be familiar to you since we discussed it in a previous course. Recall that DMAIC, or DMACI, stands for Define, Measure, Analyze, Improve, and Control. And it maps out to five steps that you can take when working toward continuous improvements. So when considering how you can improve customer experiences, start with the following. First, you'll need to define the business problem, goals, resources, project scope, and project timeline. Next, measure. Here you'll conduct performance metrics and data collection to establish baselines and measure success. Then analyze. Work to find the root causes of problems and understand their impact. Next, improve. This means implementing a reasonable solution to the problem. Lastly, control. This is where you'll implement the changes and stay on top of monitoring the updated processes you've established. Another framework you can refer to when working through continuous improvements is PDCA. PDCA is a four-step process that focuses on identifying a problem, fixing that issue, assessing whether the fix was successful, and fine-tuning the final fix. The steps are as follows. First, plan. Here, you'll identify the issue and root cause and brainstorm solutions to the problem. Let's say that one type of plant isn't selling well, which means the warehouse is full of a particular species. If you don't do something fast, the plants may die soon. So, what are some viable solutions? You propose moving the items from the bottom of the sales page on the website to the top, so those plants are front and center. You could also send out email marketing campaigns featuring that plant, where you offer customers a buy one, get one offer on the plant. Second, do, or fix the problem. In this case, your sponsor decided that they didn't feel comfortable giving plants away if they could still profit. So you've decided to go with the first option, moving the plant to a more prominent part of the website. Your hypothesis is that the best way to shift older inventory is to put it in a place that customers can't miss. The next part of this framework is check. Compare your results to the goal to find out if the problem is fixed. Now you wait one week and notice if the sales numbers go up for that plant. If they did, your hypothesis is correct, and you've saved some plant lives and helped Office Green avoid financial loss. Nice job. And finally, act, or fine tune the fix to ensure continuous improvement. In our example, you decide to reorganize the website. In the future, all overstocked plants will get a prominent place on the website. Both PDCA and DeMacy are great problem-solving frameworks to apply in your day-to-day -day life and in the workplace. These frameworks help you to identify issues, reduce errors, and optimize your processes. I encourage you to think about these techniques next time you encounter a problem or notice room for improvement within a workflow. You'll be surprised at how a simple framework can help set you up for success. Awesome. Now you know more about advocating for and creating continuous improvements. We also defined and went through some examples of using frameworks, DeMacy and PDCA for process improvements. Now that you know the basics of continuous improvement and process improvement, we'll discuss the differences between projects and programs and how they intersect. I'll meet you in the next video. By now, you know that a project manager interacts with their team members on a daily basis. What you may not know is that project managers are also part of a bigger ecosystem within their business or organization. Projects are not the only endeavor a project manager may participate in. There are also programs and portfolios. A project is one single focused endeavor. A program is a collection of projects, and a portfolio is a collection of projects and programs across the whole organization. Think of it this way. Projects can exist inside of programs, which can exist inside of portfolios. Note that I said can, because this won't always be the case. Projects can also exist as separate, unrelated initiatives. But if they're a part of something bigger within the organization, projects can become a program. 
The collective and separate successes of all of these three rely on continuous improvements. So who are the people that manage these various endeavors and drive success? Let's think of this organizationally, starting with a project manager. A project manager oversees individual projects and has short-term concrete deliverables. The project manager is tasked with continuously improving their assigned project. A program manager supervises groups of projects and even other project managers and focuses on long-term business objectives. This program manager is tasked with continuously improving their assigned collection of projects. A portfolio manager supervises a grouping of projects and programs and provides centralized management to them. This portfolio manager is tasked with continuously improving their assigned collection of projects and programs. Different companies may have slightly different names for these roles, but the concept is the same. Let's examine an instance where these roles directly create continuous improvement for their organizations. A project manager has decided to offer monthly cross-departmental trainings to members of their team. Their team is small, so they figure it's helpful when people from other departments understand their workload and processes. This way, if someone is out of office, there will always be coverage. After a couple months of these trainings, the project manager realizes they not only improve processes and communication, but they act as inadvertent team builders. Because of the trainings, employees have the opportunity to interact and to get to know one another better. The project manager takes this info to their program manager, and the program manager loves this unexpected insight. Now, the program manager can establish these trainings across all of the projects that they're managing, making these continuous improvements program-wide rather than just project-wide. So exactly what would projects, programs, and portfolios look like at Office Green? Getting the Plant Pal service launched and running is a project. It's short-term and temporary. Once the service is launched successfully, the project ends. Keeping the service going indefinitely requires the project to become a program. The program, running the Plant Pal service, becomes one of Office Green's long-term business objectives, and the company will work on continuously improving the program. Now, Plant Pals, along with other projects and programs at Office Green, are included in the company's portfolio. As continuous improvements are executed in Project Plant Pals, the program and portfolios at Office Green will notice the benefits of that. For instance, let's refer to the example of overstocked plants from the previous video. While using PDCA, Plan, Do, Check, Act, you notice a drop in the sales of one of the plant varieties. So you decide to reorganize the website so the species that isn't selling is featured at the top, giving a small discount. This change is so successful that you end up making it a best practice. From now on, low performing and overstock plant varieties will be featured at the top of the website. This is in fact a new process. Running it over and over again will drive continuous improvements. The continuous improvement you made to the project reflected well in your program and portfolio. Because now that that's been tested, the same strategy can be implemented company-wide for all of the company's other sites and products, reducing waste and increasing revenue across the board. If many or all of the projects at Office Green see the same improvement, that directly benefits the program, which is the collective of the projects. If the same strategy is applied to programs at Office Green, the portfolio will directly benefit by having stronger indicators for profitability. Great, so now we've learned how to define a program and how it differs from a project. We also discussed the impact of a project that could result in a program, and we learned how a project can turn into programs or portfolios. Have you ever looked back on an event in your life and wished it went differently? Well, we can't help you go back in time, but there are things you can do to ensure you don't experience the same missteps again. In the last video, we discussed continuous improvements. One way to ensure continuous improvements is to conduct a retrospective. So let's discuss that a little more in depth. A retrospective is a workshop or meeting that gives project teams time to reflect on a project. 
Retrospectives, sometimes known as retros, should happen throughout the life cycle of a project, but mostly are implemented after major milestones, or most commonly after a project is completed. Retrospectives give you a chance to discuss successes and setbacks that took place within the project or phases. You can think of them as a form of process improvement within your project. Retrospectives serve three main purposes. First, they encourage team building because they allow team members to understand differing perspectives within their team. Second, they facilitate improved collaboration on future projects. And third, they promote positive changes in future procedures and processes. Let's detail each one. Retrospectives are great for team building since they enable teams to understand each other better and facilitate better collaboration, which improves productivity. The emphasis in retrospective is on continuous improvement and change instead of recycling old and potentially bad habits, procedures, and processes. Retrospectives are helpful because even if we plan for every possible risk, odds are that something will sneak up on us. When something does fall through the cracks and you need to reflect on it with the team, you may want to conduct a retrospective. Some additional reasons that you might want to conduct a retrospective include missed deadlines or expectations or miscommunications between stakeholders. You may also want to hold a retrospective at the end of a sprint. As a reminder, a sprint is a series of ordered tasks ending in a goal. You could also hold a retrospective after product launches and landings. These are all great opportunities to record key lessons that other people might learn from as they work on their own projects. Identifying the stumbling blocks and successes in a project helps improve future processes. But the way you decide to conduct a retrospective can vary. There's no exact formula or template for a productive retrospective. The way you choose to structure your retrospective will depend on your team and workplace. You may decide to conduct a formal, in-person retrospective if your team prefers to debrief in that setting. You can incorporate sticky notes, documents, or any other kind of physical tools to help your team debrief. Or, if you find that your team often gets off track during in-person meetings, you may decide a virtual or online retrospective is a better option. In this case, surveys might help to get thoughts organized. Although there's no one way to conduct retrospectives, there are certain best practices to keep in mind. As we previously mentioned, you'll want your retrospectives to be blameless. Making sure that everyone feels comfortable giving feedback as candidly as possible will result in the most productive retrospective. To navigate through awkward situations or sensitive subjects, it may be necessary to encourage anonymous or private feedback. A couple of tactics a project manager can use to ensure the process remains blameless are changing perspective and switching from you language to we language. Changing perspective means putting yourself in someone else's shoes. If your team is quick to blame the delivery company for their plants not arriving at the customer's office on time, think about the situation from the delivery company's perspective. Was the delivery company's route optimized and tested to avoid traffic? If not, maybe that should have been a task in your project. Using you language can get you in trouble because it can feel like everyone in the room is judging the person receiving the blame. For example, telling your project sponsor that you didn't make it clear that we didn't have money for a contingency budget when plants die is not as productive as saying, the lack of a contingency budget wasn't made fully clear from the get-go, and that's something we can improve upon for next time. The project sponsor may feel attacked and wonder why you, the project manager, didn't ask the right questions in the early stages. Maybe the fact of the matter is, is that both of you could have done a little bit more to include a contingency budget, and that's okay. Make sure you aren't only focusing on the negative. Retrospectives are about reflecting on the positive aspects of projects too. So talk about what went well. What was fun? What new things will you be able to carry with you into future projects? Maybe the sales and marketing teams don't work together often, but this gave them an opportunity to bond. Maybe you enjoyed working with the Project Plant Pal's contracted website designer so much that the team has decided to hire them full time. Whatever the positives were, they're worth celebrating. You could even order some dinner or dessert as a thank you to everyone. 
Finally, you'll want to make sure that you enact the changes you've discussed. You'll put the discussed changes in place and decide to handle the project a little differently in the next phase. Remember how I said there wasn't one exact formula or template to follow when conducting retrospectives? That's because every team learns, adapts, and grows differently. In this video, we'll talk about how to conduct a retrospective. Different situations call for different tactics, and when it comes to receiving potentially sensitive feedback, it's best to consider your team's needs. There are a couple of things to keep in mind before you begin a retrospective. First, you'll want to maintain a positive tone throughout the process. Remember, even if there are some tough conversations, the objective of a retrospective is to encourage improvements, which prepare you for future projects. In general, the retrospective should be considered a positive experience where team members feel comfortable sharing their feedback. Next, you may need to be considerate of teams outside of your own. If there are other teams you partner with regularly, they'll need to be involved in the retrospective as well. For instance, some adjacent teams that were part of the project may feel like they want to voice an opinion about the struggle to maintain communication between teams. If they choose not to be involved in the retrospective, you'll at least want to share your findings with them. After all, smoothing cross-team interactions and deliverable handoffs is a frequent topic of discussion in retrospectives. As previously mentioned, you can use various props and tools to conduct your retrospective. Here's an example of what a retrospective might entail. As you'll notice, it's pretty extensive and includes a lot of opportunity for details. You'll want to encourage as much feedback as possible from your team. This retrospective template is a standard document with room for project managers to fill out and discuss with their teams and use it to guide the conversations. Go over the chain of events in the same way that they happened in real time. What happened during the planning stage? What could have gone better? Where did your team get lucky? How about during the execution stage? As you do that, fill out the lessons learn section, which is a space for you to elaborate on things you could do differently the next time around. This is a space to include which risks materialized during your project. Was there a large gap between the original plan and its execution? How did the team feel about it? Maybe several of your project team members commented on the fact that the website launch didn't meet the original deadline. Because of this, sales team members didn't hit their numbers that month. The marketing department had to change the date on several pieces of content and ads and the sponsor had to answer to investors who were eager to view the website. Team members are upset now because if you had prioritized the website's completion and spent less time on less important tasks, this may have been avoided. It's difficult feedback, but it's pertinent for future successes to consider why this risk materialized. Next time, you'll make sure to prioritize a task with so many dependencies. Now that you've gone over how everything went, Build a better future for your team by filling out the remaining tables. The first one is action items, and we'll address the question, what actions should we take as a result of our lessons learned? You'll start on the left-hand side with the action item you want to address. Then make your way through the cells to the right as you include information like type, as in is this a tool, a process, a team, or something else? Owner, who will own this action item? and relative links. Consider where we're tracking this item. The next table is all about future considerations. Are there any risks that could become issues if not addressed in the next quarter? Do you need to pass off ownership of this project to someone else? Include those and make sure to fill out the other cells, including type. Is this a process, a team, or something else? Contact. Who can be our resource on this procedure if we need to reference it later? and again, any links that may seem relevant to this topic. That could be relevant documentation if you're passing the project off, or it may be a risk register from your project. And there you have it. Now I showed you a pretty standard retrospective as you'd fill it out, but if you feel like your team needs something a little more interactive, feel free to have fun with it. The way you gather this information from your team can be more innovative than just a list. You can use color coding, sticky notes, columns with emojis, and anything else you feel will suit your team and keep them engaged. Whatever you do, make sure you carry the lessons learned into your next projects.
Congratulations on finishing this video in the Google Project Management Certificate. Access the full learning experience, including job search help, and start to earn your official certificate by clicking on the icon. To view the next course in this video, click here. And subscribe to our channel to learn more from Google Career Certificates.